Um, my concentration ma mainly will be on India. So talking about some factors for successful entry in India and markets beyond India. So before um, we talk about some of these factors, um, you know, kind of talking about what uh, today's India's e-commerce is. Um, you know, last year that we ended India was about 12 to 14 billion dollar market. Um, we're looking at in uh, another six years for that market to be about 100 billion dollars. So it's a great uh, market to enter. One of the weird things about India is, um, unlike other countries, most of the sales come from smaller towns, right? So it's not uh, big metros. 60% uh, of sales come from tier two and uh, smaller towns, and 40% come from tier one and above. Some of the challenges that uh, companies entering markets such as India uh, face, um, uh, we did a survey and here's what they're listed as. Obviously the top challenge is customer acquisition, right? How do we acquire the customers? The biggest challenge in India has been that the customer acquisition costs have been very high. Um, the cost approximately in India is about 1,800 rupees, which comes out to about 180 pounds for uh, conversion. I'm sorry, uh, 18 pounds um, for conversion um, as far as uh, what UK would be. But that's a very high cost per customer when they're only purchasing about half of that in each of their basket sizes. The second largest challenge that they have is logistics. Obviously, a huge country like India or others um, in that region um, the biggest challenge is the infrastructure itself. There's no reach to all the different locations. Uh, the transport systems, the roads, everything um, are still catching up to what e-com is, uh, you know, what e-com needs. Obviously, the third one that um, they talked about was funding. I think that's the biggest challenge for any retail or e-tail company that's entering a market is how do you fund? Uh, because the life cycle of the return on investment is a lot larger in a small market than it is in a more developed country. And then the last one that I want to talk about is just supply chain and procurement. You know, how do you set up your whole supply chain? You know, when, how do you find the right suppliers? How do you procure goods for that particular market? So what are the critical factors uh, when you're looking at entering um, another country or another global destination? One is obviously cultural, then regulatory, technological, and then last is what I also like to talk about is the market maturity, and I, when I get to that slide, I'll talk about what that is. So when you talk about cultural uh, diversity, um, India, again, like I said, only 31% of the population uh, is in urban cities, and 69% in rural. And that it corresponds to how we sell, right? Tier one sells a lot less than tier two, okay? So there's some cultural differences, and again, this applies to a lot of Asia-Pacific countries. Um, purchase life cycle is substantially different in a country like India, uh, because the customers have a very different mindset. Uh, they have a mindset of saving and not spending, so it's hard to convince them to come online and purchase something when they're thinking about actually saving it. But that's substantially changing over time. Um, because the middle class is growing, uh, their, their wants, their needs are growing, so they're looking at e-com as potentially the way that they want to go out and purchase. In India, again, another unique cultural difference, every state has its own uniqueness, right? There are different languages, um, there are different uh, ways that they buy, so a strategy cannot be standardized across all of India. And this, again, applies to other countries as well in that region, because Every little town, every little state has its own way of working, different governments, different uh, languages, uh, different infrastructure. So the strategy has to be looked at as um, each individual place rather than a country strategy. Then what are the other challenges? Obviously rules and regulations. I think most people don't realize when they're entering another country that there are very many different rules around e-com and retail than it applies to their home country. For instance, in India, there's something called foreign direct investment, FDI, which is where you know, the government tells you what investment a foreign company can do in India. Right? Now, the weird thing is not only do they have these regulations, but it, they're different between retail and e-commerce. So they categorize e-commerce very differently than they categorize retail. So in India, in retail, if you're a single brand retail, you're allowed 100% FDI, which means you can invest 
fully as your own company in India. But when you are multi-brand, let's say uh, a marketplace such as an Amazon, I'm sorry, a Walmart, et cetera, they cannot do 100% investment, right? Um, when it comes to e-com, um, the government doesn't actually allow anything. So today, e-com is defined as a, as a channel where a foreign direct investment cannot come in at all, right? Not 50%, not 51 not 100%. Kind of weird, but again, um, the country, uh, the regulations have to be looked at. And now, again, I gave an example of India, but there's certain similar regulations when you go to Indonesia, Malaysia, et cetera, countries around uh, that region. Then each state government um, in places like India have their own interpretation of what e-commerce is, right? It's, again, it's not defined by the central government. So what happens is taxes um, or tax implications you have differs from state to state. You can't simply do a calculation saying that in India I would be paying X amount of sales tax or Y because what happens is sales, I'm sorry, from state to state, that number might change. Secondly, what's happened is some states consider, um, even on marketplaces, uh, you as a service provider. So suddenly you have service tax, okay? Some states don't consider that, so you don't have service tax. So again, I think some of the things that you would have to look out for, again, is in regulatory, is what are the tax implications when you enter that country or that region. Again, I think technology also is a big play. I know that um, most uh, Western countries, et cetera, technology is not an issue. You have a lot of choices. But when you enter a country such as India, there's some differences you would have to think about. For instance, in India, mobility is first, okay? Some of our big guys, probably do about 60 to 70% of their transactions through a mobile, okay? That's probably a lot larger than most of the Western countries, okay? So in India, when sites, when, sorry, when companies enter, at times, they don't even want to have a website. They want to first have a mobile website or a mobile app to enter the country because already 60 to 70% of the sales will anyway come through that channel. And that number um, is supposed to grow to about 75 to 80% over the next few years. Okay? So, have to, you know, even technology-wise, you have to think, you know, can your current technology work in another country? Because in India, you may, it may not be working through just a laptop or a desktop. You may want to go mobile first. Then you have differences in payments, right? Um, India is a place which kind of invented cash and delivery. And at, and at a level where 60 to 70% of the orders were being paid by cash on delivery. So when the goods arrived is when you paid them cash. Okay? Can your system support that? Can your technology support that? The next biggest trend that's coming now in India are mobile wallets. Okay? While most other countries process it through credit cards and debit cards and cash cards, et cetera, India has a very unique proposition because you either are processing most of your orders through cash on delivery or now through wallets. So can your technology, can your online site, your mobile site, your mobile app support all these kinds of payment methods that are unique to that country, to that region? Again, like I said, this is not specific only to India. This is something that that region, um, you'll see more and more countries that have cash and delivery and wallets than any other payment methods. Then, like I said, again, India has 29 states, I think, um, and each and a lot of them have different languages. And a lot of the people still want that language support. So can your technology not only support multiple languages in countries, but can they support multiple languages possibly in the same country, such as India? So one of our larger players, Snapdeal, has six or seven languages that they support inside India. So they chose six or seven major languages and support those, because they found that a lot of customers that were coming online still felt more comfortable having things presented in their own languages. So the concept is not only about a country, but inside a country, can you give them multiple languages? Then, like I said, another critical factor that I think of is market maturity. Um, something that most people don't think of when you're entering. So you have to look at where in the life cycle of that economy or that e-commerce economy that country is. For instance, India is very nascent, right? Like I said, it's only about 12 or 14 billion, right? Compared to what it will be in a few years. But because it's only 12 or 14 billion, there's, there are a couple of things you have to keep in mind. When entering, your return on investment is not gonna come in two or three years, okay? Most people go in thinking that, hey, it's gonna be just like every other market I enter, 
it's going to be a few years of return on investment. It doesn't. Sometimes the lead time is a lot longer in countries such as India because of what the market maturity is. Okay? So for instance, it might take five or seven years for your investment to, to really pay off in a country like India. Second thing when it comes to market maturity is understanding the customer. Because when the markets are mature, there's a lot less education you have to do to get that customer to buy. But when the markets are new, such as India and other countries around there, you have to ensure that the education of the customer is foremost. So you have to keep market maturity in mind when entering that. Because a lot of things change. Like I said, customer experience changes, your return on investment changes, your logistical um, infrastructure and challenges will change. So you have to keep that in mind when entering um, a new market. Then again, I think a lot of uh, people have a question of what model do I enter with, right? Um, do I develop my own teams inter internally? Or do I outsource it to someone that's an expert at that country or at that region? Okay? And we had a discussion on this, um, just another conference I was at. And I think most people um, you know, are divided on this. You know, some say that, look, long term, I have to have my own teams. And then they say, but short term, how do I get the learning process? And I think most of them concluded saying that, look, it has to be a mixed approach. Right? We have some strategy people in-house that we develop. Okay? At the same time, we outsource some of the daily work so that we can learn from others as to how to enter that country. I'll give you an example. When you're talking about digital marketing in a new country, now you don't know the ins and outs of how customers react to each campaign. But if you hire a, an agency in that, in that country to do the marketing for you, you'll get to learn from them. But again, the strategy of what you want to do, what your brand wants to do, has to be kept in-house. Okay? So something that, again, you need to look at is probably this is a mixed approach, and it will over time change. So it might start off more outsourced in the beginning, then change to more internally developed staff um, as, as you progress in that country itself. Some people, though, choose to keep only strategy in-house, and then everything else is outsourced. Um, I, I also run um, an e-tailing outfit um, in India. And again, the strategy was the same. Um, currently, we only have strategy in-house. We have a team of six people that only devise strategy. Everything else is done by outsourced teams in India. So technology development, to marketing, to even handling our orders and customer service, right? It's all outsourced except we devise what they have to say, what they have to do, what is the process behind it. Then the other question that's big is what channels do you adopt when you enter a country? And I think this is, um, this is dependent on country to country. Um, you know, do you go through the marketplace route? Which in India, again, you have uh, a Flipkart, an Amazon, a Snapdeal, et cetera. Uh, do you go your own, own, uh, your own sites? Or do you go with an end-to-end -end service provider that actually takes care of the whole strategy for you? Okay. Or do you go with a mixed approach? Okay. Again, it depends on a couple of things. Um, one is which country, which, where in, uh, you know, what is your, uh, as a brand, what is your thought behind, you know, what is your long-term goal in that country? So for instance, I will use India again as an example because that's closer to me. You would obviously enter with marketplaces because marketplaces hold most of the sales in India anyway today. A good 80 plus percent of sales go through marketplaces. Okay? So there's no way that you can only enter with your own sites when you come to India. You'll have to go through marketplaces. But as things progress, your own brand, your own site is needed so that you can have a long, long term um, play in that country. Now, there's also end to end service providers that basically take your product, take your brand, you give them a brief, and then they devise a strategy for you as to what you do now, what you do in the six months, what do you do in a year, what do you do in a few years. So again, um, depends on uh, what your goal is, what that country is. Um, for India, like I said, marketplaces is probably the way to enter um, because 80% of your sales are gonna come through that anyway. Second is, like we talked about rules and regulations, a lot of times you're not even allowed to sell yourself. So you would have to find an end-to-end -end service provider that actually does the sale selling for you, okay? so. Again, regula regulations as well as what your long-term goal is what will determine what channels you adopt. Now, 
one of the bigger things, and I think even at this conference um, and other conferences, a lot of the retailers uh, you know, have a question, you know, when I enter a country, do I want to take an approach of an omni-channel, right? Do I want to have brick and mortar stores? Do I also want to have an e-com? Do I want to have both? What do I want to do? And I think I put two question marks on there because I think the, the, the real question is why do you want a multi-channel or an omni-channel approach, right? Um, are you simply entering the country as a brand and you just want to test the waters out? Then why would you do an omni-channel? Might as well try e-com and then enter brick and mortar at a later stage. Second is obviously rules and regulations. Like I just said, in India, FDI is not allowed in e-com. So even if you want to do an omni-channel play, it's going to be very hard. Right? You'll have to find another partner that runs the e-com for you while you do the brick and mortar and somehow have the omni-channel play work. Okay? But the basic question it comes down to is why do you want omni-channel? Right? Um, because is that country even ready for it? And, and this is something I always say when brands talk about omni-channel in India, is wait, we don't even have the retail penetration. So e-com will have a larger penetration soon than retail will, I'm sorry, organized retail will. So if that's the case, then why do I want omni-channel? E-com will give me better reach than having an omni-channel play where I have both brick and mortar and, and e-com um, together. So again, multiple questions to be asked uh, when you're talking about omni-channel. So I kept the presentation very small. Um, have a lot of time for question and answer if there are any. Um, any other slides here that you have uh, questions on, um, I can kind of take on. OK. Uh, thanks for that, Ashish. Uh, are there any questions from the floor? I can come around. <laughs> 